Welcome to The Corner, the source's digital show dedicated to the sport and entertainment industry. Every two weeks, we invite a professional to share their experience, background, and challenges. The sport industry moves fast, and having their insights is the best way to keep up to speed. Welcome to The Corner. From a governing body to founding a startup, we sat down with David Fowler to discuss his career in the sports industry. The high-paced nature of sports isn't only on the field, it transfers to the business side of the industry, and David Fowler has experienced this firsthand. On this new Lacorna episode, you will enjoy David's take on the sports tech industry and learn more about his new company, Sports Tech Match. Hello everyone, great to be here for a fresh new episode of Le Corner International. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming David Fowler. David, uh, where, are we, where are we hearing you from? So I'm in Amsterdam today, Samuel. That's uh, where I currently, currently reside. Nice, nice. Um, so first things first, David, can you, can you uh, give yourself a little introduction? Give us a bit of the background on yourself. Uh, there's plenty that we'll, uh, that, that we'll touch on uh, during this podcast, but would love to get the introduction from your own words. Great. Yeah, certainly. So um, I, I, am, I currently am the, the CEO and co-founder of a, a marketplace platform uh, called Sports Tech Match, um, helping to connect buyers and vendors of, of Sports Tech solutions. I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. My, my career has taken me to um, to Zurich via uh, Amsterdam and London. I started out in the agency world um, early in my career, in the research and, and sponsorship consulting world. Um, moving from there, I actually studied on the FIFA Master for, for a year, so I have a, a really, really great um, networking bunch of friends from, from that course. And that was my springboard into FIFA, where I spent more than 10 years in the commercial team over in Zurich. Uh, and and um, having really a, a huge itch to scratch at that point on the tech side, I, I jumped into a startup project called MyKuju, and that brought me to Amsterdam, where I am today. And, and uh, yeah, the rest is, um, yeah, we can maybe dig into it further as we go. Yeah, the, the, the term startup for MyKuju feels like a, a, a long time ago, but we'll touch base on that. Uh, but what you didn't say is also you had a small gig at being a professional football player, didn't you, with Kelmarnock? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure how many of your listeners will be um, aware of, of Kilmarnock. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll save you the quiz on Kilmarnock, Samuel. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> sorry if I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> that was that was really good, really good pronunciation. I, I, I've come across a lot of people in the sports industry I, I, who, who are former, let's say, failed athletes. I don't like that term, but... Um, it was it was very accurate in my case. Uh, I wasn't good enough to to make a career in football, so um, um, yeah, I, I I decided to work on the professional side. So do you pull the good old story around the knee, or you know, like a knee yeah. injury or something that yeah, killed the dream? Exactly. That's yeah. for another day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. And so from there, so you did the FIFA Masters, and then you stayed for twelve years at FIFA, right? Um, yep. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a bit more about you. You were head of strategy and intelligence over there. Tell us a bit more about what that what that meant, how the position evolved throughout time, because uh, it can mean a lot and uh, and very little at this. Yeah, point. yeah, exactly right. Um, yeah, that was my last position. So it was a sort of um, general commercial strategy role, really looking at that time. We're we're talking about 2017, 2018, My last couple of years in, in the organization. Looking ahead to 2026, thinking about how and 2030, how we could package um, the media and marketing rights in, a, in, a, in an optimum way. Um, a really super exciting time. Uh, the organisation was sort of evolving fast. The the leadership at the top had had changed at that point. So the the current president was was in office, um, having replaced the, the previous president, President Blatter. Um, so that the organization was really going through some some really significant changes, uh, very very dynamic. Um, I think the ro- the role itself was very much a, a kind of research driven, data informed 
um, role. So we we, we also our, our small team also oversaw the the, the research program, the commercial research program. So looking after not only um, the the research that was feeding the sales efforts on the media marketing side, media marketing right side, but also uh, the research that was servicing, helping us to service sponsors and and, and give them a view on the ROI they were getting from from their engagement with the with with our properties at the time um and obviously the third element of that research piece was really looking at, at strategy how we can optimally package all of the marketing rights and all the media rights so it was very much going back to i guess where i started which sort of managing research managing data i, I do actually <laughs> sometimes i do wonder um i've been trying most of my career to get out of research but the more I think and the more I look back, the more I wish I had, <laughs> I had stayed in, in data and research. It's become so important, hasn't it, in, in the industry? There is an element. There is an element. Whenever I talk, because I had a good friend that was a team marketing as well. And all of that is between incredibly enriching. And at the same time, I, I can't help to think you're, you were there in 2017, 2018, were anticipating what the rights would structure would look like in 2026 and 2030. That feels like that, that's more than yeah. a decade. You know, yeah. it, it is so far down the line and the, the, the technology and the industry is moving so fast. Well, not the industry, but the technology is moving so fast. Uh, the, the industry is trying to catch up on the technology. But how yeah. accurate were you? Like when you when you take a step back, everything that you were thinking about in 2017, 2018, how accurate will it be with what the right structure should be for 2026 and 2030? I think actually I think a lot changed in the years following um 2017, 2018. Of, of course, FIFA implemented the FIFA Plus project, which will take a long time to to evolve and 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 I guess um, provide a return on, on, on investment for FIFA, for sure. Um, the, the whole sort of direct to consumer movement was was growing momentum and, and had been for some years before before then. But I think FIFA is in a very fortunate position that the as as one of maybe few, a few super premium properties. Certainly, when you look at the World Cup, which is holding an increasing its value uh, cycle upon cycle really uh, it was more evolution than revolution so i think yeah. um for those listening who are maybe part of smaller challenger properties i think it's fair to say that 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 um understanding and anticipating trends over you know three five ten years is is much more critical compared with um you know, sitting in the in the chair of a of a chief commercial officer at at, at FIFA, my boss at the time, who, who has that slightly more kind of certainty that that the 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 B two B revenues are going to continue to sort of roll in. I was going to ask, what do you think about that? Do you think we are going to have a major pivot from B two C, or do you think we're going to stick with B two B because just the money coming from the right holders is too important to to be comp- Competed with in some kind of way by FIFA on a direct to market, a direct to consumer approach. It's a, it's a good question, Samuel. I, 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 I don't know. I think um, you know we've seen some some successes in the direct to consumer side, maybe more so in the US with with some of the properties that have gone in early. But then, but then a few have actually sort of almost pulled pulled back, um, having been previously poster ch- children for. You know, for the direct to consumer um, movement, so I, I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit split. I, I do believe in that future, but I guess maybe um, over sort of overriding that is is this feeling that the generations which are coming um, after us, um, I, I have young children, um, preteens, and and just just like I know, I know it's a little bit cliche to say, but the the the, the, cons- the, the content consumption habits they have are wildly wildly different um you know th- like they don't know what they, they do watch tv but they don't really consume live sport despite um one of my children being a very very um dedicated football fan it's not about the 90 minute live match it's really about um following short form content um and actually more the gaming he's influenced more by the gaming side um by being part of the, the action participating 
those more more immersive experiences, um, creating content of his own. Yep. Doing that yesterday, like on his on his phone, creating. I should mention the team Manchester United that will split yeah. um, split the audience. Um, but yeah, it, it's just I think that for me is more the the, the kind of scary thing that the difference in in consumption habits it's really like vast. Yep, yep, it is definitely very different. Uh, but what I think is super interesting in what you said, and obviously you're preaching to the choir, is the whole notion <laughs> of wanting to participate, right? That whole element yeah. of we're not the generations, even us to some matter, are not passively watching content. We have a second screen, we have a first screen, we want to be part of something, we want to have a say, we want to be part of the storytelling rather than just passively watch something that has been overproduced at an editorial level. Yeah. By all means, I love the productions. I'm, I, I know for fact, for having been in that space for a long while, that giving too much leverage to the user to choose his own uh, experience is not beneficial, but there is an element of how do you accompany his experience in a smart way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in, yeah, interesting. So so I guess that that's for the FIFA side. Um, and then after FIFA, you moved over to my Kuju. So tell us a little bit about that move from going from a big governing body to a Maikuju, which was at the time a startup. Um, so tell us about that move and tell us what made you join a, a, a smaller organization. Yeah, I, I think um, back then, 2017, 2018, the sports technology market ecosystem was really heating up. And, and I was, um, I mean, that this also is, is, is context in terms of why I, started the the, or the 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 company I have since started sports tech match the, the the at that time I was getting so many um cold calls so many emails from sports tech companies which was on one hand very exciting on the other hand hugely frustrating um so the the excite, the exciting part was like this is the revolution I want to be part of it and really was looking for some time at uh, at opportunities to 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 be part of a growing tech company in sport and, and the opportunity came along to to join my Kuju. They were I think they were maybe three or four years in. I was employee number maybe 30, 35. Um in the end we the story turned out very positively. Um but there were huge like huge ups and downs and, and I think anyone thinking about making that transition um certainly should go in with open eyes. I'm sure you've you've seen a lot in, in your own experience and on that side it's uh it was we tried to scale i think so i was there 2018 middle of 2018 till sort of 20 end of 2020 we tried to scale 2019 and failed the market didn't respond um to what we were offering we sort of i wouldn't say stumbled i think that would be the wrong thing to say but we we were for some time um considering the opportunity to provide Uh, data to the uh, betting intermediaries, you know, the big um, sport radars, geniuses of the world, um, sort of took it slowly, but eventually that that door was was wide open, and that was actually the the route that ultimately led to the success of the of the business, or at least to the business becoming a, an acquisition target. In, in addition to the technology stack that had been built up over a number of years, which was was also um, Kind of leading edge for it for for its time, uh, like Mike Kuju was one of the real sort of pioneers in terms of uh, developing um, off the shelf streaming technology that could be widely adopted um, yeah. at very low cost. Um, you know, fairly reliable uh, became ever more reliable over the years. So so yeah, it was really that 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 excitement of being part of the revolution, and and it certainly didn't disappoint. Like it was a. Uh, Two and a half years of of ups and downs, um, of a lot of stress, but huge learnings and huge satisfaction that that uh, we we made it we made it work uh, somehow in the end, and we got the you know we, we were acquired by by Eleven Sports, and of course now the my old colleagues are part of the zone, having been um, acquired again um, yeah. recently. Yeah, and it, it's always good to also hear that. You know, when you t talk about this journey, I thought it was going to be all oh, my Kuju and we exploded and we sold, et cetera. I know that like the journey is always hard from, yeah. from an exterior standpoint. There's always a good marketing story, but it's good to yeah. hear that from the inside, 
it's hard for everyone. Um, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a hard business being on this startup side of things with incredible achievements. When you are in Mykudra and you get acquired by 11 Sports and then the zone and you actually become part of the tech stack be- behind the biggest project in OTT. Yeah. Um, but yet the journey to get there is tough. It was tough. Yeah, it was tough. I think, um, I think everybody, if you ask anybody who was involved in that project, I'm sure you get, you know, I guess probably in the end, I would imagine over 100 people, well over 100 people were part of the project over a period of like pre-acquisition, a period of five, six, maybe seven years. Um, and everyone will have their own story to tell. And, and I, I guess everyone will have a story of ups and downs, um, which I think which I think is fairly typical, right? Like, it, it, as you say, there's a lot of marketing fluff around these these um, journeys from startup to scale up. But we we had hugely stressful times um, letting lots of people go. Uh, and 2019 was probably the, I think that was the low point for everyone. We, a lot of people, good people um, were made redundant um and yeah it's, it's part of the yeah part of the process but that, i guess that's also the the experience i gained there has been hugely hugely valuable since i since yeah. i left hugely valuable i can't i can't understate that it's been uh really really important to what i'm doing now yep yep you're not a real entrepreneur until you have to do your first bunch of layoffs and understand the <laughs> The complexities behind it, and uh, it, it is it is it is a tough exercise. Um, have you been there? Huh? <laughs> have you been there? Unfortunately, I have. Yeah, unfortunately, oh, I have. It's not a yeah, fun exercise. It's um, good. Yeah. Um, but it, not, nice. And so, like taking one step. So you go to FIFA. You you go from FIFA to my Kuju to now your an entrepreneurial journey. So tell us more about Sports Tech Match. What are you looking to solve? Why did you actually? go in that entrepreneurial journey, having just stated how complex and hard it might be uh, along the way. So tell us more about the whole project. Yeah, yeah, great. So it's, um, I, I, I guess I mentioned previously, like the excitement, but also the frustration of being on the receiving end of, of many inquiries while at FIFA from, from sports tech companies as, as the whole ecosystem was growing fast. And uh, having been through the, the MyQG project, I experienced the frustrations of, um, trying to uh, you know play a role in growing a, a business from a sales and marketing perspective um, and and the long procurement cycles that we faced the the, the frankly quite poorly managed RFP processes that that we were part of um, I think one of the one of the common experiences that I'm sure resonates with many tech companies out there um, is that you know you read in the sports, industry media that, that somebody has won a tender um, and you, you never were made aware of the tender at all. So you never had a chance to participate in it. And it's, it's hugely frustrating when you believe so strongly in the product you're building and and the people around you and, and, and you believe that your capabilities are well matched to the requirements of of the, of the let's say, the buyer um, in, in any case. So that, that that's really both sides of the of the of the sort of divide if you like and I felt there must be a better way to um, bring these two sides together to solve some of these challenges uh, so I think what 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 we're building is a procurement platform for the buyer side so we, we're, we're, we've built um, the first tools that will help buyers to evaluate the the growing number of of sports tech vendors that are in the market um, to do so anonymously so one of our key USPs as we Again, going back to the sort of risk of, of spamming and the risk of cold calling, we enable um, rights holders and, and, and their their um, their agencies to effectively engage the market anonymously, find the best um, the best uh, vendors for their for their requirements, um, do the filtering um, very quickly in a very lean way. So it's a sort of the first product we built was a pre RFP product, simple RFI. Product. And then on the on the vendor side, we're building a, a kind of sales and marketing hub, if you like. So we, we, we're building more and more tools that will help vendors to position themselves for growth, to win business. So, for example, we're about to deploy the first ratings and reviews tool um, for the sports industry. We've had a successful pilot program um, where we uh, worked with about 15 to 20 vendors who invited customers to review their uh, specific products within their, their, their product portfolio. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, we, we learned that 
we, we actually learned that, that it might be possible to implement something like this in the sports industry, um, yeah. which was a huge um, a huge uh, concern we had when we started. Obviously, as you know, no, no guarantees that, that going from a sort of pilot into a full-blown kind of MVP deployment, there's no guarantees the MVP is going to work and there's, there's some differences between the dynamics of running a sort of pilot and, and then, then transferring that into an MVP, of course, but that's the life and that's the chance you take, the risk you take. So I was well, super excited. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the summary, really. A procurement platform for buyer side and a sales and marketing um, platform for the for the vendor side. And, and ultimately, our, our our ambition is to to scale up um, across the sports tech um, industry. And, and, and actually, with the tools we build, we, we feel that if we get it right, there's, there's a a universality there that, that those tools will also be applicable for non-sport categories. So um, the ambition is, was always to, to to look at look beyond sports tech, and w- what that means we we haven't haven't yet <laughs> figured out because we we have to be very very cautious and honest that we're still at the start. We we've right. just you know we've just proven um, we've just collected certain proof points. We've built a small community. Um, we're not. We don't have a. I wouldn't say we have a full sort of you know clear product market fit yet, yeah. um, but we do know we're creating value. We do know we're creating connections on a on a in a manner which is 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 scalable, infinitely scalable. Um, but still, we yeah a lot of refining, a lot of work to be done to to get the first phase set up and 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 start you know investing for growth. So we're not quite at that growth stage yet. Yeah. Interesting. And so there, there are two elements that come to my mind. So the centralization of RFPs, there's definitely an element where everybody wants to be made aware of the RFPs where they can potentially answer. But like to 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 mention one of the processes I've been in recently was for a platform for a, a league who was launching its OTT platform. They actually tried to open it up as much as possible to, to as many um, companies. 27 companies actually answered the RFP. Yeah. And so I'm thinking... The need on the tech side of things is super important, but how are you going to make the platform relevant for um, those organizations to actually have more value than just reaching out to people? Because maybe an assumption is, at least on my side, that these organizations are narrowing down before launching an RFP, the people they want to talk to. They might be missing out on a few, but do they really care because they, you know, nobody's going to be able to judge them inside their organization for not looking at the potential best vendor. That's a good point. So, yeah, tell us a bit more about. That's a really good point, Sam, because I, I guess in the end, it all comes down to sort of human psychology and more basic things, right? So, um, and, and that that's why the first product we developed was an RFI product. So it's a super streamlined pre-RFP filtering tool. So those 27 would, would come through a, a more streamlined RFI, can be evaluated very quickly and then yeah. give give the buyer the confidence that when they invite a number of those people to the to, to a closed process, for example, at yeah. least there's been a there's been a higher level filtering um of of all possible all possible uh, v- vendors who, who who could could deliver could deliver to the, the, the requirements. So that that is certainly um is certainly something that we don't necessarily wouldn't necessarily um disagree with that, that open RFPs are not always the best way to go. Hence, why we would encourage buyers to actually filter the market in a more streamlined way if they if they do believe that it's counterproductive to you know to go out with a, a public RFP for that reason because it can be a huge burden. Like twenty seven responses, having been having run many RFP processes at, processes at FIFA, having you know five or six responses is a huge burden. Given normally these RFP documents are quite heavy yeah um, and the responses are quite heavy and and you've got multiple rounds and it's it's uh but the this is all the the, the these types of processes we still find and he listening to buyers there are very few tools to support people so the processes are, are either run by if you're lucky a central procurement team um and if you're not you take it on yourself as as part of a business unit who, who has a need and, and yeah. generally speaking, if you're in the latter category, there's no support, no tools, no consistency. Um, it's all down to you, down to personal preference. You might get some guidance from superiors, but in the end, um, you, you, you kind of make it up as you go along. And 
there's really a huge opportunity to to create to create tools, a toolbox, a toolkit that these people can use. Um, that also actually on the vendor side can bring the familiarity, the benefits of you know auto populated sections about my company that that, that can be um, easily seamlessly integrated into any RFP that can avoid time wasted on both sides. So that that, that really is a for, for us we see that as a fairly quick quick win if you like. Um, yeah. We're not there with our RFP tools as I, as I mentioned. We're really starting at the high level filtering. Um, uh, element of the of the process first, but yep. um, the ambition is effectively to to, to establish those those standard uh, tools, create a toolbox, an RFP toolbox that that can be adapted by um, by buyers across yeah across actually across not only tier one tier two yeah also I was going to say there's also an element because we're we're going back up right the the the, the value chain so there's the RFP at the end where you choose your vendor there's the RFI where you capture information but there's also a step before who is the consultant or the expert that's going to help you in writing yeah. those needs is that part of the thought yeah. process that you have yeah absolutely like we we, we um we're we're not we're we're a platform we're not a consulting business we have no ambition to be be a consulting business we we rely on consultants like you to actually come in and, and do the auditing to um, define strategies, requirements. Uh, we, we, what we want to avoid is that that we're part of processes that are, are not well considered um, from that perspective. Like there should always be, always be a strategic context or a business need that has been defined, um, you know, has been fleshed out in terms of requirements. So we, we are like, we, we are so dependent upon that, that consulting layer in the sports industry and, and and that's i think we will continue to be so um as we move forward yeah yeah super interesting and so what what is the size of your team right now like to be able to develop that platform like where are you at in your in, in the company's journey yeah so we we're mostly um outsourcing our, our developments we have we have a an operations manager um who, who works from from india uh, we have a product manager who works from the us and he coordinates an outsourced uh, development team for the moment so you know we're, we're operating very lean and, and flexible in that sense so we don't have a big team um, we don't need a, a, a big team actually because effectively what we're doing at the moment is onboarding vendors um, managing processes for buyers uh, we manage two or three processes a month as I said we're not in a growth mode yet we're still trying to manage a little bit the the demand that's coming through the platform not to over overheat and and not to to run too fast we're still building and evolving those tools um so we have uh yeah we have a, a small lean team that that uh, really focuses on the evolution of the of the platform and just managing the balance between demand from buyers and and vendors that we're onboarding interesting and and is it a strategic so uh, choice to be lean and flexible or is it just a state in your development in the sense that we were talking about layoffs and your experience at Maikuju and that how painful that was? The fact of being lean and flexible means you have a smaller team, but maybe less risk in terms of their overall revenue and more flexibility in the way to approach the growth, but you don't have the speed. Is it an angle where at some point you will look at raising funds to actually accelerate and build your own team internally? Or is it a model that you want to keep moving forward with not looking at um, um, fast acceleration, but steady accelerate, steady progress, I would say? Yeah, I think raising funds is already an option because we, we have so many proof points and, and there's maybe one or two things that we still need to establish in terms of validation of of, of, of basic assumptions but um, we're already considering raising capital as an option um, to, to accelerate our growth I think um, like any I guess like any business in our position we want to grow as fast as we can when we feel we've got the you know the, the sort of validation in place um, the proof points in place so sort of coming to the end of that phase and yeah. now already starting to think about about raising capital to to I guess grow as fast as we can and, and I guess how that how that trajectory grows it goes remains to be remains to be seen but that would be I think a a realistic and sensible option for us to to consider rather than taking a more slow steady approach which um, 
yeah, it could be it carries its own risks, I guess, right? I mean, you may, yeah. maybe the advantages of maintaining control and ownership are countered by the the um, risk of of um, I guess competitors maybe coming in to the market while you are taking a steady approach and, and, and maybe a few other things. So so that that that's sort of certainly um, foremost in, in my mind. But but yeah, there's certainly both options would be considered. Yeah. Interesting. And so where do you see your company? Maybe not five years from now, but realistically, if we look at a shorter term, we're not we're not at the time where you were doing strategy for FIFA anymore. The, no. the future is much sooner than than uh, 10 or 12 years down the line. So what what does your company look like two years from now from a product standpoint and from a from a answering a need of the market standpoint? Yeah, I, I hope um, in two years that we are you know, we have a sustainable business. So we have, first of all, like we're monetizing, we we um, understand the dynamics. So we, we've got pricing right. We, we're managing costs. We we see the, let's say we've, we've proven sustainable revenue generation and, and actually, I guess, hopefully cash flow positive in, in, in a couple of years, I would imagine we, we would be, able to, to to prove that by by then and, and i think that the the rough plan we have is um next year really to establish the tech to test monetization towards the end of this year early next year and to, to actually establish the the revenue model um and, and the year after that 2025 to start looking at potentially growing into other either tech related tech verticals gaming entertainment media um and or um, non-tech uh, B2B sports categories. So there's certainly, you know, a whole world of, of important products and services that sports organizations are, are, are acquiring that, that are, are just as, as interesting for us outside of the technology side. But I, th I think that decision, that's not something that we want to think too much about today. But we would hope in two years' time we're, we're, we're looking at growth outside of, of sports tech, having proven the business model within sports tech. Interesting. So monetization for yourselves, uh, the, I guess the main interest is going to be centralization plus qualification of the information that is coming on the platform to, to help the potential buyers. And then the idea is going to be move from the sports vertical to multiple verticals that are somewhat not too far from sports yet quite a bit different in the way to address because you will be able to leverage some of the developments across different industries. Yeah, exactly, Sam. Yeah, I think that's um, it's good, it's a good summary. There's lots of opportunity with those adjacent verticals, either, as I mentioned, gaming, entertainment, um, tech, or or moving into non-tech sports categories. There's, there's, or, I mean, both both are clearly opportunities and very, I guess, the, the, the customer is, in many cases, is somewhat similar um, so bridging into those, we would hope, uh, wouldn't be too much of a of a leap. But uh, yeah, a lot of work to be done <laughs> before yeah. before we think about that. <laughs> and how are you liking it being on the entrepreneurial side versus the big organization side? Well, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure uh, your your own, uh, your own experiences are, are somewhat similar. I mean, I, I guess the you know financial risk is is foremost right when you when you take yeah. this road you don't take it because uh well you shouldn't take it if you want to earn a fast buck it's not going to happen maybe 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 less than one percent are lucky in in that sense but um i i think i'm motivated by creating something that might um of course of course i'm motivated by building a a business and and, and the financial element but i'm the reason that i get up every morning is because i think i can make a bit of a difference to the industry and I can create something which is, you know, hasn't been done that I see is, is really needed. I think is really needed from listening to, to, to people around the industry. I still feel there is a, a huge need. So I think the, the, the motivation for me there is, is pretty, pretty clear, pretty strong and remains strong and, and continues to get stronger actually um, uh, to, to today. So yeah, that's the, that's the, the the goal. That's the motivation. Yeah. But it's not it's not financial at the moment. It's certainly, uh, yeah, <laughs> as no, you, that, I'm that, sure that. you've experienced it. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the race to richness is not the. You, you don't go down that route if you're no. actually looking at me, at being rich fast. The no. dream of the few entrepreneurs that do it is very. Uh, 
is really the tree in front of the forest that hides all the people that are struggling to yeah. uh, make ends meet. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. And what do you miss sometimes potentially on being in a bigger organization, right? Because the excitement is definitely one, the pace yeah. of things on, on the startup side of things. Yeah. I have never been on the other side, right? And sometimes like right. oh, the comfort of a big organization yeah. would, be you know, would, would be nice, but also some of the topics that you're able to tackle. Once again, it's between crazy to me that you're talking about your strategy in 2026 and 2030 to get yeah. back to that point that you were discussing in yeah. 2017, 2018. Yet it's incredibly fulfilling, I would say, probably to actually work in that kind of way in a very strategic, long-term approach, anticipation, trying to minimize the risk and, and all that. What do you miss from being in a bigger organization? I can I can tell you, Sammy, what I don't miss. And, and what I don't miss is, is managing managing relationships, uh, let's say, politic with a, which have a political kind of political dynamic. Um, I think that's a problem in all organizations. I don't think it's a sports specific thing, right? But um, I, sports, I, 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 sports somehow sounds more complicated, though, to be uh, to be genuine. Yeah, maybe. And I, I, I do think sometimes when we talk about, you know, sport is obviously a small industry compared with retail or, or telecoms or whatever, but but it is complicated. Like the, the stakeholder relationships are really complicated in sport. I, I, again, I can't. I guess I, I don't have the, the the deep knowledge of of other other bigger industries. But but certainly that the sport has such a unique this federated model that, that sport operates under. It's, it has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. It's it's complex. Um, it crosses borders and cultures and. It's hugely demanding. Like I do not envy, you know, the, the the guys at the top of of the international federations. Yes, they have, you know, they enjoy benefits, but they they have a really, really, um, I guess, stressful, tough um, time. And I, you know, I don't ask anyone to get the violins out for those guys because I, I know there's not a huge amount of sympathy. But yeah, you're but, gonna have a tough time again. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get any. Um, any uh, support for that for those comments, but I, I mean the, the the stakeholder management involved at, at that level, at the top level of, of, of international federations, are hugely demanding. And I think even in a you know in a, in a sort of administration, when you're leading a, a team, the the dynamics and the the, the, the the office politics. And again, I don't think this is sport specific, but I just got very tired and drained by. Um, by that, and, and that was something I didn't find when I went to the startup side. I found like just actually a lot of the the people I worked with, certainly at my Kuju, they were not particularly sports savvy or or, or sports fans, particularly yeah. the, the product and tech side. I guess that that's somewhat common, but um, there was no egos. There was no. It was all very open. It was all about you know we've got this goal and we're going to go for it. Um, Again, similar international company, international cultures, but didn't have the same, the same uh, energy wasted from like uh, trying to manage relationships. And that that part, I, I don't, I don't miss at all. I didn't answer your question, Samuel, but no, but it, 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 it is actually super <laughs> interesting because the the whole that's why I personally respect a lot of good leaders because there's not that many. It's a super hard job, and yeah. when you're actually doing it right and fulfilling your task, and also getting some credit for being a good person with your team and like driving change is actually a lot of competencies and there's a lot of stress associated to it. I can't imagine the the volume of stress that you're facing when you're at that top level. It yeah. comes with the perks of making a lot of money, but yeah. I'm not sure making all that money um, is fulfilling to yeah. anyone that is facing that, that big of a volume of stress. Yeah. Yeah. I would um, also question that. <laughs> 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 at least it's not the route we want it. We seem to want to take. No, no. Um, cool. Well, look, super interesting, David. One thing we love doing is um, at the end of those, at the, at the end of our recordings is ask a little bit our guests, what is something that they've seen recently that they're passionate about, whether it is a book, whether it is a series, whether it is a leader in the sports industry that you've been following, uh, that could be a good recommendation to our, to our listeners. Um, yeah, I, 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 a book I recently read, um, a book called Bounce. Uh, some some listeners might be aware of it. Written by a an English table tennis champion and now journalist called Matthew Syed. Have you read it? It's my favorite book. 
It is. Oh, that right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I would recommend bounce on a daily basis. The notion of talent versus work. I just, yeah, yeah. Like, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating. That whole notion of why Mozart became Mozart and why the the, the champion in table tennis became the champion in the ta table tennis and the way in which he learned and it's 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 uh it's amazing. I had to. It's, I had to get back from it a little bit now that I have kids and I've seen different talents in kids, yeah. like really. But yeah. there is that element of, hey, with work, there's a lot that you can cover. And I think that yeah. the, uh, the it's a mix of the strong skills that you learn in a particular context and the soft skills that you learn from, you know, just having a, 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 a point that you want to achieve in life and just sticking to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well summed up. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, find it. It's a good book. <laughs> yeah, and maybe a Siri or leader, anything else that you'd like to recommend? Um, well, a leader, that's 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 um that's a good question. I, I think uh yeah, that's a tough one. Um that's a tough one. I need I'll need to come back to you on that, Samuel. That that that's that's uh that's as you said, that, that the, it's the, a the real thing. <laughs> The bounce recommendation is the best you could get, so, so we can stick with that one. Well, all, all, all the leaders I admire are leaders on the football field, um, and, and probably I would come up with some Scottish football names that would completely like confuse. As a Manchester United fan, I, I'm, I'm guessing who you who, who you're targeting there. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough once to have um, to speak to Sir Alex Ferguson, and, and, and funnily enough, he, he comes from a, not not so far away from from me, and he's he's the type of guy. I, th I think one of the skills he has is, is just, in a, aside from his leadership qualities, his memory. His memory is so, so good. His memory for details, like I guess uh, it's a special talent. And, and some of the details he remembered when I, I mean, I was lucky enough to speak to him um, about uh, very, very like uh, specific matches, specific things that had happened in his past and drawing on that experience. Um, it was just just hugely impressive. Um, so yeah, that, that, he he is. I mean, he's he's yeah, he is old number one man, boss. Legend. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yep. The, the, the very old school, but yet yeah, almost to learn from those guys. I'm not sure I would like to be in the dressing room. To be honest, I'm, I'm not. He's, he's one of those guys you admire from afar, but but you know that if you were part of his team, you would. Uh, you probably wouldn't enjoy it. So, so and I'm also wondering how much his style of management would fit the younger generation also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's a whole whole different conversation for yeah. a whole different time. Yeah. Um, different David, thanks a lot for your time. Super, super good catching up with you. You too, Sam. You really enjoyed it. Hope to Terrific. speak soon. Terrific. And thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this episode. As usual, go like, share, talk about La Corner International and look forward to, to having you on a, on a future episode. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy it as much as we love creating them. If you like the episode, feel free to comment, rate, and share with people around you. You can visit our website, www.lastsource.io, to learn more about our activities. You will discover a wide range of articles and can subscribe to our newsletter to receive the latest tech and sports news in your mailbox every month. Stay tuned for new episodes. Le corner.